Welcome to lesson 2-2, Characteristics of Quadratic Functions. So we'll talk about two forms of quadratic equations in this lesson. The first, of course, is vertex form, which was all in uh, section 2.1, which you watched the other day. So just a quick overview of vertex form. You'll see that you have f of x is equal to a times the quantity of x minus h squared plus k, where h comma k is the vertex. The axis of symmetry is at x equals h. The domain is all real numbers. Sometimes we write the symbol all real numbers in interval notation this way, or of course you can use your symbol, all real numbers. If it opens up, we know that the range is gonna be y greater than or equal to k, k being the y value, so the lowest y value, and therefore the range y greater than or equal to k, and if it opens down, y less than or equal to k. It's vertex form. Let's remind you of an example of that now. Um, but before we get to that, let's remind you so here we go, f of x is equal to negative 2 times x plus 3, that quantity squared, plus 4. Uh, we could graph this using transformations, or if we remember what h comma k is equal to, we can look here and see that h is equal to negative 3. Now remember, that's because that would be x minus negative 3 there in the parentheses. So h is equal to negative 3, and here is k, k being equal to 4. So my vertex is at negative three comma four. So we'll go there to negative three comma four, which put it right up here. So now let's get a couple more points here. I might do a little something different than what we did the other day. You could go through and do that whole transformation thing if you want. But the other way that you can do this, because we know all about symmetry, right? We know that the vertex is gonna go right here in the middle. So we can use that vertex and the idea of that vertex to come up with the other values in our table. So negative three being the vertex, then I can number up and I can get a couple more points and I can number down. So you'll see that I'll fill in my table of values going from negative six to zero because that negative three, four is in fact the vertex. Now all I gotta do is I have to plug in some numbers into my original equation. So I may take this negative two right here and plug it in. So I'll do negative two times the quantity of negative two plus three squared plus four. And let's see here, when I do that math and I get the calculator, negative two plus three is gonna give me one, one squared is one, times negative two would give me negative two, plus four gives me two as that coordinate pair. I'll repeat this for negative one. Let's see here, negative one plus three. So I'm taking this negative one, negative one plus three is two. Two squared would give me four. Four times negative two is negative eight. And negative eight plus four would give me the value of negative four. And then zero, of course, zero plus three is three. Squared is nine times negative two is negative 18. Plus four gives me negative 14. And then I can use the idea of symmetry to know that this value will, of course, match up with this value. So if negative 2, 2 is a point, negative 4, 2 is a point. The value for negative 5 would match up with negative 1 because of symmetry. So I know that the point is negative 5, negative 4. And 0, negative 14 symmetrically would match up here with negative 6. So I get the point negative 6, negative 14. And if I plot these points over here, I can come up with a accurate graph, a very accurate graph, as a matter of fact. Um, negative one, negative four, and then down there, and I'd come up with this quadratic graph, this parabola that's over there on the side plotting those points. And again, we know the axis of symmetry is right down here at x equals negative three. So I'm using the axis of symmetry. I'm using a table of values to come up with some nice points for my graph. But there is another form for a quadratic equation. And to get there, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to do a little algebra here. So I'm going to simplify this expression that's in vertex form. And to simplify it, I'm simply going to take this parenthesis right here, and I'm going to square it. Well, now let's remember what that means. That means take this negative 2 and take that x plus 3 and square it, which means x plus 3 times itself. So I write out that parentheses. Then if I take this right here, the x plus 3 times the x plus 3, and I'm going to multiply that out. So that's going to be foiling. So x squared plus the insides 3x plus the outsides 3x plus the last, which is 9. 
I don't wanna do anything else, so I'm gonna keep the other stuff exactly the same. Okay, then I can combine my like terms. So let's see here, what are my like terms? On the inside of those parentheses, that would just be the 3x and the 3x. So that'll give me 6x. Then I got the plus four that's still in the problem. Now I can take this negative two and I can distribute it into my parentheses. So I gotta distribute it to all three things. Let's see here, what do I end up with? Well, let's see here, negative two x squared. And then I got negative two times the positive six, which would give me negative 12 x. And then I got the negative two times the positive nine, which would give me negative 18. Then I can combine my like terms, which would just be these last two things here. And I get negative 2x minus 12x minus 14. This is a different form of the exact same equation. So this is vertex form. And this down here is another form, what we call standard form. Standard form. More on that here in a second. So standard form is in the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And in order to find the axis of symmetry, well, it's not as nice as vertex form. Vertex form, we can figure out what it is just by looking at it. But here, to find the axis of symmetry, it's kind of hidden within the equation. So we have a formula for finding the axis of symmetry. The opposite of b over 2 times a. And then once we find the x value of the vertex, that's what this is, the x value of the vertex. These are the same. All what I do is I plug this value, whatever this number is, back into my original equation. That will give me a y value. This is just a fancy way of saying, plug the x value back into the original equation. Don't be confused by this. We'll go over it with the next problem. The form doesn't change the domain of a quadratic equation. It's still all real numbers. And the a value does not change what happens. If a is positive, it still opens up. If a is negative, it still opens down. That doesn't change. Let's not get too hung up on this notation for the range down here. We'll be sure to go over that with our first example problem. So pause the video right now. You definitely wanna write this stuff down and have this in your notes. So go ahead and pause the video now and we'll continue shortly. Now that you've had a chance to write that down, let's actually go through an example problem. Before I do anything else, I think it's really important that we're able to identify A, B, and C in this problem. So you should see that A is equal to 3, B is equal to negative 6, and C is equal to 1. This is going to help me do all of the math that I need to do before. So in order to graph this, I first want to figure out where the axis of symmetry is. And based upon what I saw with that, all that spelled out there, I know that the axis of symmetry ha happens at when x is equal to the opposite of b over 2a. So let's take and fill in some numbers. So I have the opposite of negative 6 over 2 times a, which is 3. So that's 6 over 6, which is equal to 1. So my axis of symmetry is at x equals 1. Let's go ahead and graph that over here. So there's my axis of symmetry right here at x equals 1, the axis of symmetry. Okay, so once I have the axis of symmetry, I can find the vertex. Where does the vertex happen? Well, the x value of the vertex is going to be 1. I don't know what the y value is. So how do I figure out what the y value is? Well, all I do is I take and I plug the value of 1 into my original equation. So 3 times x squared, which is now 1 squared, minus 6 times x, which is now 1, plus 1. Let's see what I end up with. 1 squared is 1 times 3 would give me 3, minus 6 plus 1. 3 minus 6 is negative 3. Negative 3 plus 1 gives me negative 2. So my vertex is at 1 comma negative 2. Okay, so now let's plot that. 1, negative 2. That's the vertex right there. Vertex at 1, negative 2. Now what? Well, let's see here. If I can create that table of values like I'm used to doing, so here's my x, here's my y, I put my vertex right here in the middle, 1, negative 2. I could number up my table, 2 and 3, and then 0 and negative 1. And let's see here. I could probably find some other values. 
And it doesn't matter what numbers you plug in, we're gonna use the numbers from this table plus the idea of symmetry to help me plot these other points. So maybe I wanna plug the value x equals zero into this equation. That's pretty easy. Zero squared is zero, times three is zero, minus six times zero, well that's zero, so I got zero minus zero, which is zero, plus one. Hey, that gives me the value of one. Because of symmetry, I know that the point zero, one is a point, zero, one, whoops. 0, 1 is a point, and because of the axis of symmetry, I know the point 2, 1 is also a point. Okay, let's see here. Maybe I plug in 3 into my equation because I feel like it. So I'll take this, this value, this x value of 3, and plug it in up here. So let's see here. 3 squared is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. Okay, we'll keep that in our head. Let's see here. Then we got 6 times 3, which is 18. So I have 27 minus 18, which is 9, plus 1 would give me 10. So I'd end up with another value of 10. Because of symmetry, I know that if I plug negative 1 into my equation, I'd also end up with 10. Now, that's not going to fit on my graph over here. So 310 is all like going to be all the way up here. And then, um, of course, negative 110 would be symmetric on the other side. That's not going to fit on my graph. I only go up to 5. So I can get a really good idea of what this graph looks like. It's going to really get steep and narrow here. So I was able to graph this in standard form. Not bad. Let's focus more on the vertex here for just a second. So... What's special here is when we see a function that is in fact decreasing and then changes into increasing, we have a special vertex here. The vertex is still that low point or that high point. And in this case, the vertex is a low point. It's a low point. And we, of course, call that a minimum. A minimum. So whenever my function goes from decreasing to increasing, I, in fact, have a minimum point. As opposed to over here on my other curve. On my other curve, this is going from increasing to decreasing. You can see that here. And in this case, my vertex is still that high or low point. But in this case, my vertex is a high point. It's a high point. We call that a maximum. And it's really important to be able to identify where these maximum and minimum values occur. They drastically affect the domain and the range for my individual functions. And of course, in this problem over here on the right-hand side where I have the minimum, we know that my a value is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And over here on the right side where I have a maximum, I know my a value is going to be less than zero. It's really important to be able to identify where these are. They helps you give a, a really good picture of what the graph of these quadratic equations are going to look like. Let's see how you do with an example problem. So take this example three, f of x is equal to one half x squared minus two x minus one. Take a minute, go ahead and identify a, b, and c. Figure out if you know where the vertex is, where the axis of symmetry is. If you want to go ahead and plot the points over here on the, on the coordinate plane that I have. And then lastly, identify the domain and range. I'm going to give you a minute to work on that, and then we can continue the video, and you can see if you were correct. So go ahead and take a minute right now, pause the video, and try this problem out. You should have found that a is equal to 1 half, b is equal to negative 2, and c is equal to negative 1. You should also see that a is greater than 0, which means this quadratic is going to open up and have a minimum. So my u will point up. Doing the calculations of the opposite of b over 2a, you should have found that the axis of symmetry is at x equals 2. Doing a couple more calculations, you should be able to figure out that the vertex is at 2, negative 3. Then using the equation and a couple other points, along with the idea of symmetry, I was able to create my table of values down here and plot the points to create this U. Again, I think it's really important that you notice that the vertex is a minimum value. So there is a minimum at the coordinate pair, two comma negative three. The domain is all real numbers, and the range, since negative three is the smallest Y value, y is greater than or equal to negative 3, or if you like interval notation, negative 3 to infinity. Either way is fine. Let's take a look at an actual example of where this is used, and if any of you have taken physics, a problem like this should be very familiar. 
The path of a ball is modeled by the equation h of x equals negative 1.2 x squared plus 4x plus 5, where x is the horizontal distance and y is the height of a ball, both in feet. Where will the ball reach its maximum height and how high is the ball thrown? Well, let's take a look at a picture of this. I'd like to really draw this out because I think it'll make this situation a little more obvious of what's actually going on. So here we have a football player throwing a ball in the air. And folks, this is real physics. Physics would actually have this problem exist because we do throw a ball and uh, modeled by an equation that is in fact a quadratic equation. Now, this is just what the situation looks like, but let's make it a little more detailed. Let's actually sketch a graph so that maybe, or put this whole picture on a coordinate plane to help us maybe answer our question a little bit better. So based upon the equation, I now have a better quadratic model that will identify some information about my football player and, and where it's thrown. So you can see that really, this question is not asking you to do anything more difficult than what we had just been doing in the previous problem. Essentially, we want to figure out where the ball reaches its maximum height. And in our particular equation, the maximum is the same as the vertex of this particular equation. So all we really have to do is find the vertex of h of x. And of course, we know how to do that. First, we figure out the x value of the vertex by using the formula we had before. x is equal to the opposite of b over 2a. So in this particular problem, negative 4 over 2 times negative 1.2. So let's see here. That's really negative 2 over, um, if I did the math, 2.4. 2 negative 2.4, which if I simplify down would give me 5 thirds which is about 1.67. Okay, so that's the x value of the vertex. We're gonna plug that into our equation to figure out what the height of the ball is. This is the maximum, that 1.6 is, is when it will reach its maximum height. Let's actually figure out how high the ball is. So to do that, we'll figure out what f of 5 thirds is. So plug that into our equation. So negative 1.2, times 5 thirds squared plus 4 times 5 thirds plus 5. Now, thank goodness I have a calculator because I could not really do that in my head, but I'd get 25 thirds when I use the calculator, which is about 8.33. So where will the ball reach its maximum height? When we are 1.67 uh, feet away from the thrower. So that would be about here, right? That's this distance here that would be 1.67 feet. And how high is the ball in the air? Well, that would be this distance from here to here, which is in fact 8.3 feet. So a little football action with quadratic equations. Folks, that ends the lesson for today. So make sure you have your notes written down and we'll talk more about this in class tomorrow.